so I'd just like to start by welcoming everyone tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, just wanted to acknowledge that uh, we are campaigning and meeting here on the unceded territory in British Columbia. Uh, this is territory where Indigenous peoples have governed and stewarded the land for thousands of years. Uh, I myself am here today on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, uh, and I'm deeply saddened by today's Supreme Court decision to deny the appeal of BC First Nations to challenge the approval of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Reconciliation, living up to our obligations under UNDRIP, these things demand that we acknowledge the rights and title of Indigenous peoples, uh, and the BC Greens will continue to oppose the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Uh, my name is Christina Winter. I will be moderating this town hall today. Uh, it is my honor to be the co-campaign manager for Sonia Firstenau's campaign to be the leader of the BC Greens. Uh, we're very excited that the leadership race is back on and at tonight's town hall, Sonia will be talking about her recently released strategy for renewal platform. Uh, so just before Sonia introduces the strategy for renewal and we talk up to people and take questions as well as some questions that we've had in advance, uh, I'd just like to go over the rules of engagement for the webinar. So uh, I did mention this is our first time using the Zoom webinar format. So thank you all so much uh, for any patience that we have with anything technical, uh, any challenges. Uh, you're very, very welcome to send your comments and suggestions to me at Christina at SoniaFirstenow.ca. Uh, I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, if there's anything that we can do to improve, please let me know. Um, for everyone who is here, your microphone is unmuted. Um, please leave it muted unless you're asked to turn it on. I will just allow people to speak as they are included on the speakers list. Uh, I also just want to let you know that the town hall is being recorded and the current speaker is recorded. So as you can see, you can see Sonia and myself on video. N your videos are not active. Uh, Maeve has made some funny comments about how we should definitely not see her and she's correct we we can't see any of you so you're not being recorded um, if you would like to ask a question your voice will be recorded uh, in that case if you do not want to be recorded you're still welcome to ask questions through the Q&A so what I'd like to point out to everybody which is really cool with the webinar format is that there is a Q&A so if you go either to the bottom of your screen, there should be a Q&A button, or there's a triple button that says more if your screen is smaller. And towards the bottom of that list, there's a little button that says Q&A. So that allows you to see questions that are being asked. Um, I have set it to allow anonymous questions, and you should be able to see all of the questions that have been asked. So this is a way that people can actually upvote questions. So if you see somebody else has asked a question and you're interested in the same thing, you can add your own vote to it. You're also able to comment on the questions. Please let me know through chat if for any reason this isn't working. Like I said, it's our first time using it, but I think that this is a great way for us to make sure that we're getting to the questions that are the most of the most interest to the most people. Um, so in addition to the Q&A section, we have had some questions submitted in advance. So we will be making sure that those get asked throughout this meeting. And you're also welcome to ask a question yourself. If you'd like to take a turn asking a question, please just send us a note in chat and I will add you to the speaking order. Um, if you are going to ask a question, we will ask you to limit your time to 60 to 90 seconds, just to ensure that Sonia is able to answer as many questions as possible. Um, at the 90 second mark, I will be making an announcement and we will have to cut off access to microphones at 120 seconds just in the interest of time. Uh, if you have any questions about this process, again, please engage with me through the chat box and I'll be happy to help you. Um, one last thing is I would just really like to say a heartfelt thank you to all of our donors that are making this meeting possible. Um, our campaign has really been investing heavily in digital tools and these are the things that we need to engage with members, bring in new supporters, and excite our organizers and volunteers and potential candidates to grow our team for the next election. It's really the generosity of our donors that makes all of this work possible. If you would like to contribute to Sonia's leadership campaign, please visit her website at soniafirstenow.ca slash donate. And this is gonna help us get ready for the big green breakthrough that we're all working for in the next provincial election. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Sonia Firstenow, uh, current MLA for Couch and Valley and the next leader of the BC Green Party, here tonight to discuss her strategy for renewal. 
Sonia? Thanks, Christina. Thanks to everybody who's here. It's a little strange not being able to know who, who's all here, but uh, it's nice to see a few messages in the chat box. Um, I'm on the unceded territory of the Cowichan people and uh, delighted to be working uh, with and for the um, people here in, in Cowichan territory. And uh, I'm, I wanna start just with um, really acknowledging the incredible work of Christina and Jillian. Uh, they call themselves the co-managers of the campaign. I call them the co-goddesses. Um, they're, they're just uh, an extraordinary duo um, and they're backed up, I know, by so many uh, volunteers and supporters and all of you who are making this campaign possible, uh, given that um, I'm juggling quite a bit <laughs> with the legislature back in session and, and all the joys and excitement that comes with that. Uh, so I just really want to thank Christine and Jillian and, and everybody who's helping out and participating in this campaign. It's really, uh, it, it, it's really inspiring to be um, part of something that really feels like the kind of teamwork that it's going to take for us to accomplish what we want for the BC Greens, but also just generally to accomplish what we want in the world. We're going to have to be collaborative uh, and team oriented in that. So this morning when I was thinking about uh, tonight, uh, I was reflecting on um, a couple of things. One was, uh, for some reason, I, it, I went back to a lecture that uh, I had when I was in my undergraduate studies about uh, sort of late medieval views. I did a master's degree in, uh, undergraduate degree in master's in history um, with a focus on medieval history. And there was this late medieval idea about the body politic and this notion that if there was something unhealthy in the body, uh, then you, you wanted to get to the, the root cause of that and be able to heal it. And I think, uh, you know, where we're at right now in the world with a, uh, a zoonotic pandemic, um, which is of no surprise to epidemiologists. And uh, I happen to have a, a friend who lives here in Shawnigan who's doing her PhD on zoonotic diseases. And she uh, met with us a while ago and pointed out that the rate at which we're seeing these um, zoonotic, which means diseases that transfer from animals to humans and then human to human um, infection, uh, is, is steadily increasing. So other zoonotics that we have uh, include AIDS, HIV AIDS, um, Ebola, H1N1 was zoonotic, uh, SARS, MERS. And as you'll notice, what's happening is we're, we're seeing these arrive more and more quickly. Uh, and we're currently in this global pandemic that is quite serious. Um, and what I've, you know, been reading and hearing from experts is that, uh, you know, there will be more to come. And why will there be more to come? Because of the way that we uh, raise animals. The, the Spanish flu actually originated in Kansas uh, on a, I understand, on a pig farm. And we've actually created these conditions, not, you know, how we raise animals, but also the, uh, the kind of disruption of our natural world. And so we, we keep creating these conditions for these outcomes that experts and scientists are saying, you know, these are coming. Uh, and yet we are very slow to act proactively to stop them. And so it's, you know, I, I, I think about two things when it comes down to the idea of, of political leadership. One is the question of asking ourselves, how did we get to where we are? And importantly, the other question to ask is where do we want to go? What, what kind of world do we want to be creating? And that's ultimately what we do in, in elected office is we make decisions that shape the future. And so we can look at decisions in the past that have resulted in good outcomes. Um, universal health care, uh, investing in public education, investing in public health. Um, these, are, these are the kinds of decisions that were made in the past that we benefit from today. And we can also look at decisions that have been made that aren't particularly resulting in good outcomes. And when you look at the last four, 40 years, the last four decades, where we have really uh, kind of carved away at the role of government, carved away at public institutions, 
and, and stripped things down so deeply that when we hit a crisis like this, it's, it's much harder for us to, uh, to, to cope, generally speaking. Now, some areas are definitely better off than others. And I think when we look at the United States, a lot of the uh, discourse around how COVID is uh, exploding down there is connected to the, the lack of the public health investments that they've had and lack of a universal health system. So leadership really, for me, is about reflecting deeply on on all of these things constantly being curious constantly wanting to understand more about the world we're in how we got here but also really engaging with a vision of what's possible where we could be and i i think we've we've become so accustomed in politics to this notion that we're in this ever present now everything has to be about whatever you know you can deliver in a four-year uh electoral cycle as opposed to where are we gonna be in 20 years, in 40 years, in 50 years, in 100 years? And, and I think that if we can start to envision that the kinds of communities, the kinds of cities, the kind of province, the kind of country we want to be in, we want our children to raise their children in, then we can start to measure the, the sort of ideas and policies and, and um, legislation against that fundamental question, does this take us to where we want to get? And so the, the strategy for um, renewal, the platform piece that has recently come out, really is about, okay, how do we become a more resilient province? How do we have communities that are more resilient, that are healthier, that are places to live that actually contribute to our health and well-being? Um, and much like the first platform piece on a resilient economy, that was also very much centered on how do we create a, an economy that creates well-being for the most important factor in any economy, which is the humans who are inside that economy, who are both the, the, the creators and ultimately should be the, the beneficiaries of a healthy, resilient economy. It's the same thing with our communities. And when I think about, uh, you know, uh, resilient, healthy communities, it comes down to how we get around. Uh, can I bike? Can I walk? Are my kids safe playing uh, outside? Uh, can I get transportation uh, to different places through using transit, which would be ideal? Um, you know, how do I interact with my neighbors? Does it create a sense of community? Uh, all of these things. And so when we've We've been thinking about these platform pieces. It really is in this bigger vision of what's the world we want to create, and and rejecting this idea that uh, you know we can't possibly dream of a better world. Uh, everything that we can dream, we can make happen. It takes political will and it takes uh, you know hard work. But uh, that's that's just where I want to start. Those are my reflections for the day, and and I'm the uh, Really looking forward to taking questions and hearing from you. Great. Thanks so much, Sonia. Uh, we do have our first question in the Q&A section um, from Denise. Uh, given Horgan's wonderful job related to the current health crisis, how can the Green Party keep and grow its support? It's a great question, Denise. And um, there's a couple aspects to that. Uh, obviously, we're, we're delighted with how well uh, government has handled the health crisis that we're in. Um, and I want to really give kudos to where it belongs, which is uh, the remarkably calm and, and uh, capable hands of Dr. Bonnie Henry. Sorry, I have a little tickle in my throat. <coughs> Not sick, though. Um, uh, and, and one of the things that we can look at in how the province has handled um, this pandemic is that it was very much driven by an evidence-based response. So we had a medical health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, who is an expert in pandemics. And so, and she has, uh, she has worked in, in different realms. She was uh, involved when the SARS pandemic hit or the SARS uh, outbreak hit, and she's also been involved with Ebola. And so we were very fortunate to have a, a real expert guiding us as a province through this. 
And we were also very fortunate that the politicians recognized that in this kind of crisis, we put the experts uh, front and center because when the public hears from uh, somebody who understands deeply what she's talking about, they're more likely to trust and follow the guidance of that expert. And that's what we've seen in BC, just an absolutely remarkable uh, overall adherence to the, to the guidance of the, of the provincial health officer. And we had to, uh, we were very fortunate in that we didn't have to go to the kind of lengths or the extreme lockdown that other provinces did and other jurisdictions have had to go to because people were so willing to follow those guidelines. So that translates into, yes, uh, you know, overall uh, general um, pleasure, happiness with how the government has handled this. Uh, however, there's another part to this, uh, to, to COVID, and that's going to be the recovery. And that's going to be the vision for how we emerge out of this uh, better, healthier, um, with a stronger economy, with an economy that also looks at addressing the other very significant threat that we have globally, which is climate change. And so uh, I think over the next few months, uh, there will be a lot to see about how Horgan presents a vision for the future that is different from the vision that he's had over the last uh, several years. And one of the challenges, of course, that we've had with the NDP government has been their willingness to continue to subsidize the oil and gas industry. Uh, and that is absolutely the wrong direction uh, for any government to be going right now, particularly when we, we need to be transitioning to uh, clean renewable energy, but also to a, a much healthier economy overall that doesn't say that uh, success in an economy means moving people out of their communities to go work in work camps at, at sites that are the opposite of healthy um, and that undermine the health of our ecological systems. So I think that uh, what we're going to do uh, very consistently is put forward a different vision, a very different vision from the NDP and from the Liberals and hope to inspire people to see that we can uh, move, we can change the trajectory of the whole province uh, to become healthier and uh, transitioning to a much better economy than we have been, uh, than we have now, one that, that really does benefit the people of the province. Great, thank you so much, Sonia. Uh, so the next question from our Q&A is, what is your plan for growing our MLA count? Uh, that's a great question. It's such an important question. So number one, uh, a lot of the work that we're doing in this campaign is really about getting out this inspiring vision and, and sort of high level ideas about where we can go in a pro as a province. Another big part of what we're doing in this campaign is connecting with people all over the province, connecting with potential candidates, talking to stakeholders, talking to experts, getting people engaged and excited about the, the potential of a stronger BC Green presence in the, in the legislature and recognizing uh, that we want to invest in the ridings where we have uh, you know, an excellent chance of getting more seats uh, and we want to bring in candidates that are really reflective of a kind of exciting, diverse uh, vision for the province and for politics generally. I think, you know, the great thing about working with Adam uh, and the team that we have at the legislature is that we are all in all the time and, and we're looking for the same kind of uh, like energetic and excited uh, people who are, are ready to lean in to bring really significant change. And I think it, if we can uh, you know, get this vision out and get people who are excited by it, and there are some really very exciting candidates out there potentially, uh, I think we could have, uh, we could really show some growth of the number of MLAs in the legislature in the next session. One more thing about that is the testament, the story of this minority government. And, and while there are uh, clearly disappointments with some of the decisions that the NDP have made, this will be looked at as a historic period in BC history. Um, you know, we are on track to being the longest lasting minority government in Canadian history. Uh, 
when you look at some of the things that have happened under this, uh, under this minority government, we have brought in UNDRIP, and that is a testament, and it was acknowledged publicly to the incredible work and, and commitment of Adam. We have brought in reforms to the professional reliance system, which was so important to me and, and was really the motivating factor for why I ran the environmental assessment process. We have highlighted and brought changes to the uh, child welfare system, particularly when it comes to the overrepresentation of Indigenous children. Uh, you know, the list goes on and on, and, and, and that's the external policies. Internally, uh, the legislature as an institution is deeply transformed as a result of the last three years. Um, I was on a legislative assembly management committee today, and the, the collaborative, cooperative work that happens across all three parties uh, in service to the institution is unprecedented in BC history. It just, it just has not happened before. And so I think that what's going to be important is to really be able to convey how healthy uh, this minority government has been for democracy and for the institutions of democracy in British Columbia and how important it is to have this, uh, th this going forward because this is how we make very big very progressive changes in this province. Perfect. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, I'm going to go to one of the questions that was asked in advance. Um, and there's a little bit of preparatory. So if we acknowledge and accept that uh, government is unable to unilaterally overhaul the mechanisms that run the economy in time to halt the global climate crisis, and capital interests do have the capacity to act in support of wellness and a purely environmental message is insufficient to win government and the old adage that what you measure matters do you see kate raworth's donut model offering a framework to government business and the general public through which we can both strive for and measure progress towards environmental and social justice I love the donut model. And in fact, if you, I, I've recommended this film to Christina and I think she's going to see to line it up for a volunteer film night. It's, uh, I think it's called 2040. And it's the idea of what if we implemented for a start, uh, the donut model of economics, which, which uh, for folks who aren't, I'm, I'm not going to do it justice, but it, it's the idea that we operate uh, within our, our ecological limits, that's the outer out, uh, edge of, the, of a donut shape, and that we, we maintain uh, social, educational uh, policies, health policies that prevent people from falling into the middle of the donut so, so that um, you're, you're both pulling people up uh, into that donut and you're stopping the donut from operate from the economy from operating outside the the kind of natural parameters uh, of a, you know a sustainable approach and and what i what i really appreciate about it and in the movie 2040 the kate is actually interviewed and and it's used as a kind of um anchor for for discussions in the whole movie about what if we implemented what is what exists today how would it look in 20 years from now? Uh, and it's, it's a joyful, wonderful, very inspiring, exciting film because it, it's really what I'm talking about is this idea of seeing a different future and imagining how much better it could be uh, for, for many more people. Um, and the, the thing about the, the donut economics is it, it rejects this, uh, this, these kind of underlying assumptions that we have about economy that have been driving decisions by governments for decades now, which is somehow the economy is something separate from the environment and it's separate from humans and it's separate from health and education. Uh, what what uh, Kate has done with the donut model is to recognize that all of these things operate together. And so when we make investments in health and education uh, and social services and, and you know, mental health supports and transportation and uh, it, it, transit, uh, walking paths, all of these investments are actually beneficial to the economy. They're not something you do only if you happen to have 
a whole bunch of extra money in the bank. There's something you do to actually make your economy thrive. And I think that uh, these kinds of reimaginings of economics, which is happening not just um, with the donut model, but economists uh, all, all around the world are, are coming to the point of recognizing that the old models are not serving us. I mean, we can, we can I think, fundamentally agree that trickle-down economics was a, uh, a very bad direction for us to go in for a very long time. Uh, and we have to have a completely different conceptualization of, of economics. And, and that's what I love about uh, how she's doing it. I'm so excited that the mayor of Amsterdam is, uh, is using the donut economic model uh, to drive COVID recovery for, for Amsterdam. And I think that this, I'll, I'll end on this when you say you only value what you measure, which is one of the reasons we've been pushing so hard for genuine progress indicators. Uh, and I, I wholeheartedly agree that when we are only measuring GDP, uh, we're, we're, we're losing so much of what we have to be measuring, have to be valuing. We have to measure health outcomes, education outcomes, uh, health of people, health of our environment. Uh, and once we start measuring those and valuing them, as they are doing, for example, in uh, the Sunshine Coast, uh, where Gibson's Landing is, is valuing their natural assets, valuing the service that their watershed gives to them as a community, as opposed to only valuing a water treatment plant, while the standing forest is actually a much more effective water treatment plant than anything you could build with engineers, uh, then they start to make decisions based on recognizing the value. And so um, I'm, I'm all in on, on those, uh, those approaches. Great. Thanks, Sonia. Greg, uh, we, sorry, uh, if you go to whatsyour2040.com, that's how you can find out about the movie, and I think you can stream it. Right. Now, the next questions come from Alan, uh, and it's been very popular, and it is something that we've heard a lot about with our uh, email responses as well. How about a four-day work week? How would that work? So I just want to start with, it, it, this has been a really interesting experience. It, we, re, we released our economic, our re, uh, resilient economy platform, um, as I said, focusing on health and well-being uh, back in February in the before times. Uh, we actually went to Vancouver, which now seems like such a exciting and foreign prospect. <laughs> um, and one of the pieces in that platform um, was, uh, and I'm going to read it so, I, so that you know exactly what it said. It says, in consultation with business, labor, and other stakeholders, explore policies to improve work-life balance and health and well-being for workers, such as a shorter work week for full-time workers and modernized labor laws for independent contract workers. And it got some attention at the time. There was uh, a, a, a couple of media stories that really focused on a shorter work week idea. And then um, after uh, Jacinda Ardern uh, talked about it in New Zealand, the four-day work week as, a, as one model for looking at as part of COVID recovery, the reporters here in BC were like, oh, right, Sonia talked about that. And so then there was another flurry of, uh, of media attention on this idea. And I think what's really important is at, at no time have I ever suggested that it would be a top down or government mandated because where it has worked, and this has been the most interesting part of all this, is that um, we have been uh, um, in contact with a fellow named Alex Pong, who's written a book called Shorter, where he looked at over a hundred companies that have pivoted to a four day work week, um, where uh, they don't reduce uh, income for workers. Your, your, your income stays the same, you work four days instead of five, and consistently what the data from these companies shows is, is very interesting. It's a couple of things. One, productivity actually increases. Two, um, Generally, for the companies, uh, revenue either stays the same or goes up. It does not decline. Um, and three, most uh, interestingly for me, is that the workers are healthier and happier. And there is a steep, steep, steep decline in people taking sick days, in people missing work uh, to, to get to appointments. Um, 
and so he's he's written this book and and um we've had a couple of opportunities to talk directly with him and he's really a fascinating person um and in the wake of uh jacinda ardern's commentary on this uh all over the world it's like popcorn this idea of shortening the work week has has gained steam and in fact today alex sent me a report from um Liverpool, and this is a joint report done by the city of Liverpool and the University of Liverpool, in which they looked at uh, a four day work week. Uh, and they have key takeaways and, and uh, I'm going to read them. They're so exciting. So number one key takeaway from their analysis on the potential for a four day work week is a shorter working week could help the UK economy transition in the wake of COVID in a way that brings positive benefits for people and planet, including improving workforce health and well-being, promoting greater gender equality and delivering environmental benefits. Um, and the second key takeaway, and I think this is really important because this conversation about a four day work week is in, in, for me, it's in a much wider conversation about the nature of work, the nature of the benefits that accrue from work and, and how unequal those benefits have become in a lot of cases where um, the workers uh, are not benefiting anywhere near as much as uh, the CEOs and shareholders in, in some cases. And there, you know, you can look at policies that start to say, okay, there, there can't be the, the level of disparity uh, that there has come to be in, in some realms. And I would point to, uh, you know, the billionaires who have become wealthier over the, the months of the COVID pandemic, and particularly uh, someone like Jeff Bezos with Amazon, where the workers uh, are not benefiting from, from the enormous wealth that's accruing uh, increasingly into fewer and fewer hands. And that's a problem. And that's, you know, inequality is a problem socially. It's, it's, it's a problem that uh, you can ignore it for a certain extent of time, and then inevitably it will lead to uh, very serious social uh, unrest, economic problems. And so I think we have to be very serious about the economy. But the second takeaway from the, um, the Liverpool report here, to ensure that wages do not fall as working hours are reduced, governments will need to legislate so that productivity gains from advances in fields like automation are distributed amongst the workforce rather than amassed by the owners of the machines. And, and to me, this is a very, you know, this, this kind of time that we're in, and Alex Pong talks about this quite a bit, that almost every company that does transition to a four-day work week has transitioned to it in a time of crisis. So he often likes to cite, uh, you know, chefs who have had 20-year careers where they work, you know, 10 hour days and seven hours, seven days a week, and they, they reach a breaking point and they, they shift how they work and they shift how their restaurants work. And it turns out to be better for everybody. Everybody does better out of this. Um, interestingly, he also notes that of the 100 plus companies that he looked at, um, very few of them uh, reverted back. And the ones that did, it was because they hadn't had a plan in place for how they were going to transition. The vast majority, like 99%, um, maintained the four-day work week. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's important to see it as, uh, again, as, as the, the possibility that exists in a time like this where we are in a global crisis and uh, the capacity to think outside of the box is, is wide open right now. And what's so exciting is that Yesterday, there was an article from Sri Lanka on switching to a four-day work week. Um, it, it, it's, it's happening all over the world. I was on a, a webinar with a company from Ireland, and I can tell you what, on this webinar, there was Ireland companies, New Zealand companies, and a British company, and the biggest cheerleaders for the, the four-day work week were the CEOs of these companies who would never go back. In Ireland, it's this company, ICE, um, and they're a sales company. And they, they proudly advertise on the outside of the building, home of the three-day weekend. And uh, they have seen profits, productivity, health and helping, happiness of their employees go way up uh, after transitioning to a four-day work week. Um, and so looking at it as this is very much going to be, I expect, uh, 
uh, businesses taking leadership in this, showing what's possible. Um, in the in the Liverpool report, it's interestingly uh, they're suggesting that the public sector sector can be um, a test bed and leader for the shorter work week. We're already seeing that uh, in Nova Scotia. There's a there's a region that's gone to a four day work week for their municipality. There's Salt Spring Island has a four day school week, um, and and I think what we're going to see is uh, increasingly it's it's like the old stories where we're rejecting some of these notions of you know what what it means to be working in this world and we want quality over quantity and if the data shows and the evidence shows that you actually get better quality work uh when your workers are have that three days off one you know to to be healthy and well uh and more excited and more productive when they do come to work uh, I, I see this as uh, a transition that is well underway. Great, thank you so much, Sonia. Uh, we have a bunch of questions that have come up in the Q&A. So I will start uh, with Jocelyn's. Uh, it says that uh, I think the NDP is doing a very good job on health and homelessness, but their policies and track record are still horrible. Logging the last remnants of old growth, increasing fracking, very lax mining regulations with exemptions for such things like tax release of selenium. Um, so we're looking for some comments on that as well as how can Greens help the electorate to see the need for more green MLAs to make sure that government protects the environment and meets climate targets. Yeah, and, and it's, it's a great point. Uh, you know, again, it's, it's what we measure. So we're, we're, we're inclined to look at government's performance as how it affects uh, our, ourselves uh, individually. That's, that's something that politicians kind of count on. And we really went down this road, um, it, it, you know, into particularly when social media started becoming such an engine for, uh, for getting to voters, uh, these kind of very micro-targeted policies. Um, and, you know, the one that comes to mind for me is, um, you know, policies around tax credit for um, sporting goods for kids. Uh, and that was a, a big vote getter for the Harper Conservatives in his time. Um, and so, you know, the the, the challenge that we have is, is again, uh, sort of pulling the threads together of all of these different aspects of society that our health and well being is actually connected to healthy ecosystems. And that if we, if we let those ecosystems become uh, too degraded, it will ultimately have a negative impact on our well being. It will also ultimately have a negative impact on our economic well being. Um, and so Adam and I um, have, have worked very hard on uh, the old growth piece. We continue uh, to work on that and we're, we're, we're not relenting um, on, on the call to put a moratorium on, uh, you know, logging some of the last remaining uh, ancient forests in, in the world. Um, you know, and, and the, the real risk is the consultation that this government likes to do is, oh, well, we'll just do more consultation. We'll just do more consultation. We'll just do more consultation. And by the time the consultation is all done, the forests are actually gone. And then we're, there's no more conversation to have. Uh, and so we're, we're pushing very hard on that. And getting, I think there is a growing awareness. I think there is a, you know, when you look at uh, the number of voters who are concerned about climate, when you look at, at young, you know, millennials and, and Gen Z voters uh, who are now coming of age and, and recognizing that they have grown up in a world of, uh, you know, climate uncertainty and uh, they are grappling with the reality that, you know, they're going to be inheriting uh, a more degraded world than, than we did um, from, our, from our parents. And, and this is not the, the way that we should be going. We really do owe a debt to future generations. And I think that showing that um, we can make decisions that, uh, that put long-term well-being at the center of them, that, that are good decisions and that, that benefit people um, 
that it's not this trade-off that we've been told for so long between you have to choose between the economy and the environment. It's, it's just patently untrue. Um, and what I'm seeing is more and more people who are deeply engaged and deeply excited about, again, reimagining how we can live much more in balance, not just with our own health and well-being, but with the health and well-being of the, the world around us. And uh, we just have to do a really good job of, of getting you know, extraordinary candidates in, in all parts of BC and really getting that story out of what's possible and how exciting it is to imagine uh, not a dark and dismal and degraded future, but a future in which our communities are just healthy, thriving, wonderful places to live. Nope, Christine is frozen. Catnap. Christina, come back. All right, I'm going to take. Oh, excellent. Okay. Uh, our I, next question is coming. Oh, am I there now, Sonia? You're here. I'm just going to run and grab, grab a glass of water. I'll be 10 All seconds. Right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. We're going to be, we're going to take a, just a quick two minute break. Um, I'm sorry, that was my internet over here. And Sonia's just going to grab a glass of water. Um, so if you have not yet taken a look at the question and answer, we have a couple of questions that are up. So if you are interested in any of those, go ahead and give those a little upvote and we'll make sure that those get to the top of the queue. I'm back. Um, if you have any suggestions, if you have any comments for how to improve the webinar, please reach out to me at christina at sonyafirstnow.ca. Uh, we are going to be having more meetings like this and I'd love to hear your suggestions and feedback. Um, so Sonia, once you have finished your drink, uh, we're going to move to Eric's question. So technology workers had many of their labor rights stripped under the Campbell Liberal government. Uh, as a result, many people still fall outside the usual employment standards. How can we address this gap without triggering a new tech exodus from BC? Such an important question. And, and in fact, I was, um, uh, we're, we have budget estimates happening right now by Zoom. <laughs> everything's by zoom and i actually put this question to the to the labor minister really about precarious workers um and gig workers in british columbia um as well as you know technology workers and uh the fact he he cited the fact this was on friday he said well you know an employee for uber uh just won a, a, a supreme court of canada case that they can have their cases heard um, against the company in, in the countries where they're operating. They don't have to go to the Netherlands for arbitration anymore. And my response to him was, you know, if employees, if workers in this country and in this province have to go to the Supreme Court of Canada to get their, uh, their rights as workers protected, then there is enormous legislative work to do. And, you know, this, this falls again into the, the, the false economies of uh, the kind of race to bottom idea that if, if we present the, the kind of starkest and, and least regulated realms will attract the most businesses. And I think, again, this is, this is the opposite of how we should be thinking. And there was a great article by the former CEO of the Victoria Chamber of Commerce um, back in January or February. And she made you know, just such a compelling case for, if you wanna attract business, if you wanna attract the high tech industry, which we absolutely do to BC, um, you, the government's role is to create the conditions that make it very appealing to live here. And that starts with transit. It starts with really high quality um, early childhood education, which we've been working on collaboratively um, it's with the NDP on that file. Uh, really excellent public education, uh, again, livable, wonderful communities to live in. Those conditions are what is going to ultimately attract the kind the, the you know, people who want to live here in BC because it's such a wonderful place to live. Uh, but if we put the infrastructure uh, in place, we can, we can make it better. And at the same time, we have to ensure uh, and this comes back to the, you know, the report that I was just telling you about from Liverpool, that government puts legislation and policies in place that protect uh, workers, that don't allow um, that gap between 
uh, you know, the highest paid and the lowest paid to get to a point that is uh, unacceptable. And that, that's become, uh, you know, such a common uh, aspect of, of, the, of the economic world today. So, you know, there are, there are very substantive and concrete things that we can do. Um, but recognizing that, uh, you know, leaving precarious gig workers um, to their own devices and leaving them without the kinds of protections that we should absolutely expect for workers is, is just not a way to, to, um, to build a healthy economy in this province. Great, thanks for that answer, Sonia. Um, the next question here is from Christine. Many people in BC face food insecurity. What's to say about the adequacy of our social safety net and social assistance? That's a big question. So food security, adequacy of our social safety net um, and social systems. Uh, we should be alarmed on all fronts on those. Um, I think that um, the, the food security question has certainly been highlighted by COVID and by the recognition that um, global supply chains can easily be disrupted. I think, again, we lived under this kind of myth that things just magically appear and we don't have to worry about them. And it became very clear very quickly that that's not the case. And that if we want to build resilience, we need to have water security, food security, and energy security uh, built into that, into our, our communities and our regions. Um, and we have a long ways to go. We've, we've, we've gone very far backwards in food security. And, and this is one of the things in, in the film 2040 is that it takes a lot less land to grow food for humans than what we use most of our land, uh, our sort of um, industrial agricultural land for. Um, and most of the industrial agricultural land is, is um, food for um, animals. So it's corn being grown to feed to cows and pigs. Um, or it's corn and soy that go into, you know, this kind of processed food products. If we focused on uh, um, food growing, uh, we could actually, you know, grow quite a bit more food than what we're doing. And that also means looking at, you know, uh, and this comes back to the zoonotic diseases. Like we have to look at how these things are connected. The, the conditions under which we're raising animals are not only bad for food security generally and for soil generally and for water health, including ocean water because of the runoff from uh, the, these massive industrial farms um, can both contaminate groundwater and surface water. Um, but it's, it's dangerous to our health because it's the, the breeding ground for what can be very dangerous pathogens. Um, and so it, again, this is a, a big political will question um, but recognizing that we need to put in policies uh, and legislations that, that, that creates that foundation of food security. So here in Cowichan, uh, one example is the Cow-Op. It's, you know, it's a local farmers and there's a, a cooperative and they can sell and distribute their food locally that way. And I think supporting your local farmers, supporting local cooperatives is really important. Um, and but there's, there's a lot of work to be done on the food security front. Social safety net, uh, you know, the, the mental health and addictions crisis that we see in BC, which claimed um, more lives uh, than COVID did in the last several months, uh, is so serious. And it's, it comes back to that idea of the body politic. Like there is something unwell in, in our, the body of our society uh, that so many people are um, <clears throat> turning to uh, drugs to be able to soothe the pain that they're feeling. And, and I was just on a phone call earlier today with the representative for children and youth, and um, she reminded me of, of a report that came out from their office about a year ago about youth drug addiction. And when you read through the report, all the way through it. I mean, this is, these are, are young people who have experienced trauma um, and loss and they, they need support to be able to cope with that and often find themselves uh, without that support network, without people who can help them. And in a system of 
kind of institutionalizing, whether it's the child welfare system or whether it's when they, you know, they age out of that or when they come into a, a community that doesn't have the kind of supports that they need, uh, they, they will uh, unfortunately often turn to, uh, to substance abuse in order to, to cope with the trauma and loss that they feel. So looking at, um, you know, we need to put mental health and well-being into the fabric of our health system, our education system. We need to be able to recognize that, that mental health is health. Um, we need to stop spending money on punishing people and spend that money instead on supporting people, supporting families, supporting communities. Uh, when we look at uh, Indigenous communities and, and the, the ongoing overrepresentation of Indigenous children in, in the child welfare system, uh, I've been arguing from, from the very beginning that the hundreds of millions of dollars that is spent on that system, if that money was spent instead on supporting families, on Indigenous-led initiatives to, to deal with intergenerational trauma as a result of residential schools, the 60 scoop, uh, relentless, unremitting racism in our society. Uh, we can make turnarounds that uh, that would see so much better outcomes than what we get right now. And this comes back to the the bigger question right now around, you know, defund the police. I think what we we have to focus on on what do we want? We want to have uh, the supports available in our society so that people can actually. Uh, be at their best, that they can thrive. And to do that, we have to be very mindful of where we're spending money. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, we have had one follow-up question, and I think that it's worth um, asking as a clarification. Um, how would we get to a norm of a four-day work week if the intention is not to mandate it? Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So I, again, from what I've seen from other regions, so um, where where it's, uh, companies do this, it, it can be sort of like uh, contagious, where um, if one company, so the, the, the company in Ireland, again, I'll use that as an as a example, because the, the, the folks on the webinar were just so informative and enthusiastic. Uh, you know, when other companies, uh, when, when employers, employees are looking at where they want to work and they have company A that says, we'll pay you uh, X amount and you work four days a week, you get a three day weekend uh, and you're going to be the happiest, healthiest employee you've ever been. And another company says, we're going to pay you the same amount to work five days a week. Um, employees are going to want to go to the company where uh, they work four days a week and get paid the same amount. Um, and the company that does that is going to benefit from the higher rates of productivity uh, and in their case, the profits that, that were, they were seeing. Um, and this is what the research is showing is that as one company does it, it starts to uh, have an impact on others. It can be incentivized. So uh, on this webinar as well, they were talking about how in New Zealand, the government is supporting companies to do pilot projects for a four day week to, to help them through that transition period and to create the structures that work. And so that, that's one way that government can help, not mandating, uh, but incentivizing and providing policies that encourage companies to do this. Um, I've, I've also had local companies reach out to me since this has uh, become such a, a hot topic. And there's one uh, small little retail outlet in Duncan and he wrote to me and told me all about how he has, um, he's, he, they manufacture small little wooden gift items. And he wanted to be able to balance the needs of his employees, one of whom has a, a small child, uh, and, uh, and to keep them happy and keep them, he really wanted to keep them employed. And so he transitioned to a four day work week where one of his employees works Monday to Thursday and his other employee works Tuesday to Friday. Um, and he has seen uh, real benefits from this, including as with all these other companies, uh, a, an absolute drop off of sick days um, and, and happier, healthier employees uh, and, and no impact to um, 
his revenues, in fact, his expenses have gone down. So his, his profits have gone up. Um, so I think that what's, what's becoming clear is that um, it's, it's without mandating, it, it, it's gonna have a, a kind of uh, innovative business leader leadership happening. Um, but like I said, you know, public service or the public sector can also lead by example uh, and, and transition to this. The PEI uh, provincial government, uh, a motion was just introduced to move the legislature to a four day work week there. Um, and so I, I think that as with uh, a lot of things, recognizing that business needs are very diverse, businesses are, are not monochromatic or, or universally the same, um, but government can be there to incentivize and support these kinds of policies as they're going forward. That's great. Thanks so much for the clarification, Sonia. Uh, we have Jan who would like to ask a question live. So Jan, I'm going to set you to talk. So if you just want to check to make sure your microphone is on, um, you are... Okay. Thanks. Hi, Sonia. Hi, Jan. Um, uh, I'm really thinking about what could be done um, right now during the leadership campaign to highlight some of the differences between the Green Party and other parties, and in particular on environmental policies. Like, I just find it heartbreaking that old growth forest is being cut at all in Valley Bottoms right now. and. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, any ideas you have about what we could do right now to bring those issues, you know, and the sightsee dam just seems even now so stupid, you yeah. know, so. Yeah, I, I hear you. And, and I think, I, you know, the answer to that is that Adam and I continue to work very hard in the legislature. We have a summer session, so we're going to be in the legislature all of July, half of August. We've had one week in there. And, and that's one realm where we can very much uh, identify uh, the distinction between us and old growth uh, preservation is, uh, as I said, very much at the top of our uh, priority list. We've already had um, meetings with stakeholders on this. Uh, we've had meetings with government on it. We are making uh, it really clear that we are going to persist in our position, as you say, that these valley bottoms uh, cannot be ripped out while, um, while we come to terms with the fact that, as was pointed out in um, Rachel Holt's report that came out about a month or so ago, that we're down to 1% of old growth left in this province. And, uh, you know, the, the government and industry have a way of saying, oh, well, you know, how do you measure old growth is is different and and always playing with these definitions but the reality is the productive uh ancient forests that are those valley bottoms that you talk about uh, are almost gone and uh adam and i are are fighting hard to uh to push this government to stop the logging while while we uh come to terms with this reality Thanks so much, Sonia. We have a couple more really popular questions that I want to make sure that we get to. Uh, the first one from Greg. If young people, say those that are under 30, should be more interested about the economic and environmental future, how can we attract more of them to support the Green Party, both as voters and as volunteers? Well, um, the goddesses here have done a great job of uh, populating our, our campaign team with young people. I actually am happiest when I'm around young people. My, I, when I was teaching a grade eight class uh, at Colquitt's uh, back in, I think, 2010, um, actually, I have the mug. They all, they, they wrote their names on a mug. It's my favorite mug of all time. Um, my husband used to say to me, like, you're kind of weird that you like to spend your day with 13 year olds. But in fact, I really do. Um, I think we have to be uh, inviting uh, to young people, but we have to be really authentic that we're not, you're not here to like fill space or be in a photo op. We want your ideas, we want your input, we want your energy, uh, and we're here to serve you. In, in fact, I think that, that what's so important for us to convey is we are 
the only party in British Columbia that is, is deeply focused on future generations as opposed to uh, the over, well, I'll count myself in this, the over 50 crowd, uh, now that I'm in my sixth decade, uh, that usually gets uh, focused on in elections. Uh, and so, I, I, you know, we have work to do, but authentic participation in, um, in, in the party, in, in the political process, in the decision making is so essential to this. And, and you know, from just one thing I've done over the last three years is uh, I've, I never say no to a, a school class or a university class that asked me to come and speak. That's always, uh, it's always a yes. And I always say at the end of the, um, at the end of the class, if you want to come and spend the day with me at the legislature, if you want to get more involved, um, just email. And we've had over 30 uh, young people come and shadow me for the day. I keep waiting for other MLAs to do this, but I'm, I'm pretty much the only one who does it. And it is, those are the best days that I have when I spend them in the company of um, youth. Uh, and I'm trying to count in my head right now, but uh, one of them got elected to Duncan City Council. Uh, another has run federally. Um, the first one, Kayla, uh, who is amazing, she was 17, and when she reached out and emailed me, she went to she go, went to the high school just down the road here, and she, this was my first. Uh, invitation and this high school student emails me and I said well come spend the day with me at the legislature and she did uh, she is uh, an employee in my constituency office has been for several years now and she's amazing if any of you ever email my constituency office the first person you're going to hear back from is is uh, Kayla Brent and she's uh, she's absolutely incredible uh, and she's also the president of the writing association here in Cowichan uh, and that's what I mean by authentic participation. It is empowering people of all ages um, to be participating in a way that is meaningful, that, that encourages everybody to bring their, their talents, their skills, their energy and their excitement to the table. And, and you know, I'm a teacher, that's, that's what I'm built to do. And, and I'm really committed to that. Wonderful. Thanks, Sonia. Um, so the next question from Eric is, a majority of British Columbians still believe that pipelines provide a net economic benefit. How do you plan to counter this misconception and reach those people? Um, I, I, I think just relentlessly uh, presenting the facts and the evidence. I, 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 I can't think of how else we do that. I, and, you know, it's not unlike the four day work week, the, the kind of rapid decline of the oil and gas industry internationally is underway. Uh, you know, economists, uh, the, the, the industries, uh, the companies who are recognizing and looking at the writing on the wall are working on the transition for their industries. Uh, there's, there's agreement, like this is a sunset industry. And the reason it carries on, the way that it's surviving is through government subsidies. And that has got to stop. Uh, and, and you know, I think that more importantly than trying to convince the population um, of BC, although I, I think we're somewhere in equilibrium around that, but that, that this is not uh, the, you know, the promising economic future that uh, some would have us believe. Um, really, it is the work on insisting that governments stop using public money uh, to prop up an industry that cannot survive on its own. I, I, it's an astonishing thing. I know historians will look back at this period, and I'd say the last 30, 40 years, and they, they will just shake their heads and, and be baffled by how long it went on that, uh, that governments continue to subsidize this industry. And that's, you know, for, for uh, Adam and I, 
our caucus work on the COVID recovery, the, the number one thing is end fossil fuel subsidies and, and just lean in deeply to the transition to a clean energy economy that we have to do in BC. We could be at the forefront. We could be uh, such leaders on this. We could be showing the world how it's done. And uh, that's what's going to have to happen. Great. Thanks, Sonia. Um, we had one of the questions that was sent in in advance on corporate money. Um, lots of corporate money that should go into government coffers is not available for public use because of tax loopholes. Um, so it, there's an appreciation that there's a BC government inquiry on money laundering going on right now. And they would like to hear a little bit more about how that's going. And then also, do you have any information on the kinds of money that could be recouped when tax loopholes are closed up? And will this help with a just recovery after COVID-19? Yeah, um, I'll start with the inquiry into money laundering. So it is uh, it is up and and going, and I uh, there was some um, there was some media out about that, and we're keeping an eye on that through our caucus. Uh, it's good that it's uh, underway. We called for it about a year and a half ago. We were making a pretty clear call for that inquiry to happen. Um, the the tax loopholes. Um, one of the most disappointing things in the last couple of years for me was when the Panama Papers came out that identified, uh, you know, people that had been hiding their assets and their wealth in offshore accounts. And while other countries uh, went after that wealth and, and got the revenues from taxation that was owed to them as governments, uh, Canada did nothing. We, we did not pursue uh, all of this offshore money that was, uh, that was, being hidden out of um, out of Canada, and we did not pursue the tax revenue that should have come from that. And so you're right, you know, it's it's uh, the tax loopholes and just the overall um, uh, ability to avoid paying taxes is significant. One of the interesting conversations again that's starting to happen, and I think is gaining some momentum, is the, the notion of taxation of wealth, um, recognizing that. Uh, Income tax is not capturing enough of that uh, that source of inequality that we're seeing, and and uh, we know that uh, as wealth accrues, it becomes in and itself a, a generator of more and more wealth. It's like a magnet, and all the filings uh, go towards it. And so we have to be serious about how are we going to bring in uh, taxation that that addresses this this very deepening inequality. In terms of the figures, I don't know what those figures are, um, but it's a really important question to be asking. And uh, it's something that, again, we need the political will, primarily at the, the federal level, to stop uh, allowing for the kind of um, mistreatment of the tax system and, and the use of these tax loopholes. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that we've got the inquiry going on here in BC. Uh, it's a pretty shocking amount of money that was being laundered through this province and uh, we, we definitely needed to get a handle on that. Perfect. Thanks, Sonia. Um, we've got a great question from Jack here as well. Uh, it would seem important for us to recruit more candidates of colour for the BC Greens in the next provincial election. What are your thoughts on this? A hundred percent. Our our candidates should look like our province, uh, and it should it should we should definitely have more candidates of color. We should be very clear about um, when I'll put it this way: when we had the debate in the legislature about um, uh, bringing in electoral reform uh, around uh, donations and and banning big money. Um, there was a, a secondary piece of legislation that didn't get quite as much attention, but it was legislation that put a limit on how much a, an individual can contribute to their own campaign at a municipal uh, level. And so it put uh, the same $1,200 limit on, I believe, I hope I'm right on that, on, yeah, I think I am, on, uh, on, donations to uh, municipal campaigns. What that did, it's so interesting, 
is the the subsequent election that happened in 20 when it was 2018 was the the first municipal election after that legislation had passed and uh i went to ubcm in 2017 and it was a sea of like lots of municipal leaders and some diversity some women some people of color but overall uh, it's kind of a sea of um old men and then you go back in 20 uh, 18 after the elections, or in 2019 actually, last fall after the 2018 election, and there are young women, there are women mayors, there are uh, more people of color, and suddenly it was a much more diverse seat. And the reason was that that limitation on uh, a $1,200 donation to your own campaign meant that for a whole bunch of people that could afford to just lay down $10,000, $15,000, $20,000 for their own campaign, suddenly they they couldn't do that anymore. And the, the younger candidates and these women candidates and these diverse candidates who were able to hustle and, and go and get uh, lots of donors and lots of enthusiasm for their campaigns could get elected. It, it leveled the playing field. Um, and so one of the things we have to look at, if we want more diverse candidates in the BC Green Party, which we absolutely do, and we want more diverse MLAs, which we absolutely do, we have to stop expecting that every candidate can operate the way that a candidate of a certain age and a certain ec socioeconomic status can operate. Um, you know, when, you, when you're uh, from a certain uh, strata of society, you come with a, a network and you come with uh, resources and wealth that maybe doesn't exist for um, more diverse candidates, for women of color. And so we have to be very serious that if we want to see people elected who are different from who we usually see elected, we have to approach how we recruit and how we support candidates differently. And I'm really committed to that. Thank you, Sonia. Um, we have a follow up to the question about the adequacy of the social welfare system uh, gets into um, what the federal government has done with paying people who were employed $2,000 a month during COVID. That's based on a minimum amount that people need to live on. Do you think that we should increase welfare payments to $2,000 per month? Or alternatively, do you agree with some form of universal basic income or universal basic services? Um, first of all, I just saw Stephanie Handy, and I know we're trying to uh, chat. I uh, thank you for your comment. Um, I, I, I'm glad that you like that response. I've been I've put a lot of thought into um, how we're going to get more diverse candidates. Uh, universal basic income is something that was in our 2017 platform. Um, we went into the agreement with the NDP and CASA to have a pilot, which got uh, shifted to a study. So there is a basic income panel of economists who are who have been studying it, uh, and their final report, I think, is out. Uh, it should be out publicly this fall, and I'm really looking forward to it. I had the incredible good fortune of going to. Um, their kind of gathering of economists in December where they were kind of giving their interim reports and, and uh, um, findings. And it was the best two days I had in 2019 because I was back in a university class filled with all these um, nerdy economists talking about data and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Um, and what's really interesting uh, is that when you start to look at the costs of the current social programming, um, th there are enormous costs that go along with how we uh, dole out social supports. And for the most part, uh, it's not working. It's not getting people out of poverty. And if the outcome that we want is to get people out of poverty, we have to stop with the punitive paternalistic nonsense that we apply um, in our social services uh, approaches. So for example, um, you know, one, one idea that, that I've been um, kind of wrestling with is around uh, the, the notion of, you could have a, a, a kind of a, a first step approach to basic income for, for poverty 
reduction, which could look like if you qualify uh, right now for social support, for income support, um, you get that income support for 12 months, no questions asked, and uh, you can go get a full-time job. But what you have uh, is the certainty that for 12 months, you can count on knowing that you have this stable income, which gives you the capacity to start to make decisions, to start to take risks, to start to uh, consider your options uh, from everything from, from housing to transportation to, to, to childcare. And you, you build in just that level of certainty that does not exist in our current models of poverty uh, alleviation. I mean, it's not, it's, you know, our, our social services system, our social, our income assistance program does not work to lift people out of poverty because it is, it is so uh, um, controlling and punitive. And so basic income is, is one way of looking at um, how do we take those restraints off and, and, uh, and give people the ability to be able to plan, to be able to think more than three, four weeks into the future uh, and be able to plan for months ahead. And that is what can get us out of um, really difficult places we're in. What I'm so interested in uh, right now, and again, this, this COVID is, is uh, really being an impetus for enormous transformation. Brian Mulroney took out a full page ad in the Globe and Mail on Saturday calling for number one, um, you know, a, a real commitment to reconciliation and, and uh, with indigenous peoples in Canada and, and taking that commitment incredibly seriously. But he also called for uh, introducing basic income. And so this is an idea um, that is also emerging as uh, an evidence-based approach to, um, to dealing with uh, creating more economic certainty for more people in the country. And that economic certainty uh, is actually a huge benefit to the economy overall. Great, thanks so much, Sonia. Uh, I just want to recognize that it is now just after quarter after eight and we have started to see some people start to drift off. So I do want to let people um, wrap and get on with the rest of their evening, maybe a little bit of R and R for everyone involved. Um, there is one last question that I'd like to make sure that we get to from Jim. Uh, Sonia, are there things that you would like those of us on the webinar to do immediately to support your efforts with Adam to stop old growth logging? Um, writing the premier, signing a petition, really Really looking at ways that we can put pressure on government and support the caucus and your work. Yeah, thanks for that, Jim. I, it's it's interesting. There is no topic that we get more input into our MLA offices than old growth. I mean, I I was on a panel um, in the fall uh, on old growth at the um, BC Forestry Association AGM, and I I told this room full of foresters like th th this is a serious issue but nothing like nothing generates the the input that like old growth forestry I had gotten 6,000 emails in one day uh, into my email account on old growth forest so and that's not to say that 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 adding your name to those emails is not a bad thing it 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 supports us it gives us that capacity to say we're not just speaking on behalf of our green caucus we're speaking on behalf of thousands and thousands of people in british columbia who really care about this issue um uh i would say letters to the editor in the newspaper is a really effective advocacy tool um if it's uh that that's one thing that that adds extra pressure so Yes, letters to the premier, letters to the forestry minister, uh, letters to all the MLAs, um, letters to the editor, uh, it, you know, just continuously pushing on this. And um, uh, when Adam and I, and we will be um, putting out, uh, you know, content on this in the coming weeks, uh, when we do really help push that out as well and, and bring attention to it, um, you know, political pressure, is an interesting thing and and one thing i learned from many many years of of advocacy and and working to build political will on 
uh, a number of issues is that uh, it's very interesting that it's, it's just no, 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 no. And then all of a sudden it's just yes, right? It, it's not like um, governments kind of show their cards and say, oh, well, maybe we're thinking about this. And if you just push a little harder, we'll get there. It's, it's often you get the same response, you get the same response, you get the same response. And then one day uh, the response changes. Um, and that's one thing about persistence that's so important in, in any kind of advocacy. And um, it's, it's kind of a who gets worn down <laughs> uh, often tension that happens there. But uh, that's one of the things that I've learned is, is being the persistent, relentless voice can, can go a long ways. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, would you like to leave us with any final thoughts? Uh, well, it's been an enjoyable evening. I, I really appreciated the questions and, and the comments. Uh, Cheryl, you're absolutely right. Our current system of social assistance absolutely does penalize people for starting to succeed, which is uh, just mind boggling to me. Um, I wish I could see you all. I wish I could be uh, in a room. I, I miss that, uh, that connection that we get when we can all be together. And uh, I, I hope that as things progress in a positive way with COVID that we will have more opportunities to, to actually come together. It's such an important part of um, building that kind of uh, energy that we're gonna need to sustain ourselves through the, the months to come as we build up a very exciting and very inspiring movement uh, for the BC Green Party. And uh, I, I'm, I'm excited. I think we have a great potential. I'm so glad that the, uh, the leadership race is back on and I'm really looking forward to, uh, you know, these weeks uh, and, and next couple of months being really the foundation for what uh, we're going to need to have going into the next election. And uh, uh, I thank you all for being here and for being part of this. I will definitely echo those thanks. Thank you so much to everyone for coming and joining us tonight. Um, I do understand that, you know, we had some technological hiccups. It's a new system. Um, if there's anyone that has been inconvenienced, please accept my sincere apologies. Um, we are very open to suggestions and comments. You can reach me at Christina at SoniaFirstenow.ca. Uh, like I said, we'd love to hear how we can improve. We do want to have more meetings like this. We're really, really happy to hear your feedback. So thank you, Sonia, for coming and spending and sharing so much of your time with us tonight. Uh, it's always a treat to hear you speak, and uh, I hope that people found it uh, very enlightening and inspiring as well. I know that I did. Thanks. And there is a bubble bath with my name on it upstairs that I will be uh, <laughs> heading to. Shortly. Perfect. Well, I hope you enjoy. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, keep in touch with us on social media. Keep an eye on the website. We will be having more events come up. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. And I hope that you all have a really wonderful evening and a wonderful weekend. Thank you all so much for coming. Really appreciate it. <laughs>